Hello and welcome to The Real USA. On today's episode, we'll explore the long-lasting impacts of climate change on important U.S. monuments. We'll check in with Occupy Wall Street three years after the movement began, and we'll also discuss how and why Americans are divided over the issues of guns and gun safety. I'm Alexandra Hall. As you watch these stories, I invite you to share your suggestions and comments via our Twitter, at Telesur English. It's clear that the Earth's climate is changing rapidly. According to a group of scientists, it's now having a serious impact on historical U.S. monuments, monuments like the Statue of Liberty. Patrice Howard has the story. Taking a snapshot with Lady Liberty is a must for many tourists exploring New York City. The statue has become one of America's strongest symbols of freedom, standing tall in the harbor for more than a century. When Superstorm Sandy slammed the city's coastline in 2012, floodwaters and gale force winds pummeled the iconic 305 foot statue, but didn't break her. Scientists say next time she may not be so lucky. Superstorm Sandy was worse because of climate change, and also that we will get more storms and more extreme weather in the future. So there are very strong trends that scientists can see showing that extreme precipitation, extreme drought uh, are all getting worse. Planet Earth is warming up, according to Adam Markham. He's with the Union of Concerned Scientists, a group whose recent study argues that America's iconic landmarks, those that tell the story of the nation's past are in clear and present danger, driven by climate change. The report points to Lady Liberty, nearby Ellis Island, and more than 20 other historic hotspots that will be wiped out by bad weather, unless lawmakers and local citizens alike take steps to mitigate the effects of climate change. We focused on these landmarks because they're important to Americans, but they're also important worldwide. Uh, we attract millions of tourists to this country every year, and millions of Americans will take their summer vacations in these places, and so we just can't afford to lose them. Which begs the question, who can afford to protect American cities from superstorms of the future? The price tag for New York's Sandy recovery was more than 42 billion U.S. dollars spent to fix housing, rebuild infrastructure, and repair public transit. The government reacted by footing the bill, but Roland Lewis of the Waterfront Alliance said Sandy is like a leaky pipe, a sign of things to come. He said the only way to protect cities like New York is not to plug the leak, but to spend proactively on new infrastructure that will hold up in future squalls. There's hundreds of millions, billions of dollars of investment to readjust Re, uh, you know, acclimate uh, our infrastructure, our coastline to sea level rise. It's a gigantic investment. It takes tax resources, financing. It'll take engineering. It's a, it's a put the man on the moon mission. It's, it's something we all have to get, gather around. The Obama administration recently took action on the issue with a pledge to reduce emissions by 26 to 28 percent below its 2005 level by 2025. We have to work together as a global community to tackle this global threat before it is too late. But Lewis says the government needs to turn promises into action sooner rather than later. We've all seen those post-apocalyptic uh, movies where uh, poor Lady Liberty is, is drowning and the, 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 the torches popping up above the water. Even if the water got to her feet, if she had to wear galoshes, I think that would drive the point home. And it, it, unfortunately, that's, that's where it's going. Hollywood has taken a few liberties to paint a picture of climate change's potentially deep impact. But scenes from Sandy's aftermath reveal that catastrophic weather events can no longer be labeled as science fiction. The concerned scientists say landmarks like Lady Liberty are treasures from the last generation who pushed for a better future. They say taking proactive steps to stop climate change now is perhaps the best gift this generation can give to the next. Patrice Howard for Telesaur, New York. We now go to New York, where three years after the Occupy Wall Street movement began, activists continue to fight inequality, climate change, hunger, and war. Many of their leaders say that the U.S. government has failed to serve the interests of the American people. Correspondent Claudia Ibarra has more. According to political activist and author Naomi Klein, we can't fight climate change without dealing with inequality inside and between our countries. 
on the third anniversary of Occupy Wall Street, a social movement that sought to draw attention on the rising economic inequality in the United States, we talked to some of its organizers that converged in flood Wall Street. A civil disobedient action to denounce the core relationship between global warming and the current economic system. I'm here today because climate change, uh, poverty, debt, um, uh, war have all been caused by a financial system and an economic system that is global, but is located and based right here on Wall Street, um, right down the street from where we are. The convergence that's going to be down in Wall Street feels like a revitalization of Occupy. And you can definitely see there is a continuity in terms of uh, people out here, but also there's um, an understanding that the systemic problems are all connected. The problems that are causing climate change are also problems of financial capital, and uh, that was also a target of Occupy. When Hurricane Sandy hit the city of New York in October 2012, leaving massive devastation, Occupy Wall Street protesters responded quicker to the emergency than many of the city agencies organizing more than 17 relief centers in the communities most affected, an effort that later was known as Occupy Sandy. While the United States continues to spend billions of dollars of public funds to subsidize the production and consumption of fossil fuels and to protect U.S. oil interests abroad with the military, in the anniversary of Occupy Wall Street, their organizers revitalized the movement through a civil disobedience action to demand the transformation of an economic system that is harming the environment. This is Clara Ibarra with Carolina Crone, Carolina Correa, Telesur, New York. The right to own a personal gun in the United States is a controversial issue. While it's explicitly protected by the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, many say that easy access to firearms could lead to an increase in violent crime. Reporter Andrea Arenas has the story. With more than 48 stores like this in the United States, guns have become the perfect Christmas gift. Usually early November through, through actually usually through end of January, we see a pretty, our pretty brisk sell season. What we recommend for most people is buy a gift card and, and that way they can come in and get whatever they want. According to state legislation, stores have to follow some requirements. Buyers have to pass a background check before they purchase any gun. For the most part, there are states that have waiting periods imposed. There are states that have fingerprint requirements. There are states that have their own background check service where you have to pay a fee for every background check that you run. It's, it's across the board. There is not a consistency. People are not allowed to buy guns when they have been previously prosecuted of any crime or when they have records of mental disorder. Nonetheless, those who promote restrictions on gun sales say these measures are not enough. You pass a background check that's run at the point of purchase, you can walk away with a gun, or as many guns as you'd like. Those who support gun ownership base their arguments on the United States Constitution and the Second Amendment. They say that a gun is essential in a country where violence increases every day. Nowadays, um, the world's gotten a little bit crazier, and I think that, that people have that, that need for, for protection. Two years ago, 20 children and six adults passed away. They were victims of a shooting in the Sandy Hook Primary School in Newtown, Connecticut. That situation increased pressure on gun control legislation. However, the federal government has never passed this legislation. Some experts state that this issue is also related to some American citizens who don't seem to understand that those guns are actually mortal. In 2012, more than 33,000 people died from guns. I mean, it's a staggering figure. So for me, I think one of the problems is things like Sandy Hook Though they shake the nation, they haven't resulted in change, and unfortunately they move the bar higher as what shocks us as a nation. Gun sales in the U.S. have doubled since 1988, when the background check was established.
According to the latest Pew Research poll, a majority of Americans support the right to own a gun more than weighing in on who should buy one. With the Republicans in the majority in both houses of Congress, some groups say that they'll support firearm ownership at the local level. More than half of the American households own a gun. According to a survey carried out by Pew Research, six out of ten Americans believe guns protect them from crime. Guns are useful in certain circumstances, but um, probably not as useful as people think that they are. <laughs> They're useful for war and defense. Nonetheless, a 30-year study carried out by an American Journal of Public Health in the United States shows a different situation. Homicides grow 0.9 percent, every 1 percent increase in gun ownership. A significant correlation that, as this activist states, denies the dictum that reads more guns, less crime. The gun from her purse and shot her accidentally. There are many accidental deaths because there are guns in the homes, and there are many intentional murders domestically. We need stronger gun control laws. Legislation on gun ownership remains the same even after the Sandy Hook massacre, where 20 children were murdered. And even though President Obama put forward federal legislation that required background check before any firearm is purchased, the Democratic-led Senate banned this initiative. Nonetheless, 90 percent of Americans even those who own a gun support this measure. I think the system must be reviewed. The rules for a gun purchase. However, I think people who are responsible should still have the opportunity to have a gun. Since lawmakers refused to pass federal regulation on gun control with a Republican-led Congress that opposes this measure, social movements have decided to take their demands to local communities and ask society to join them. Several organizations that promote gun control have decided to copy a model that allowed same-sex people to marry, a model that was gradually implemented in most of the American states. They say they are going to promote local legislation so gun ownership is gradually regulated. According to the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution, every American citizen has the right to own a gun. In the United States, students from wealthy families have traditionally had more access to the for-profit higher education system. In Chicago, some schools are having difficulty emphasizing the arts, prompting some teachers to promote the curriculum on their own. Vanessa Bergonzoli has the story. Access to quality education in the United States is becoming contingent upon wealth, creating a growing divide for students of diverse economic backgrounds. In the Chicago school system, where one out of eight teachers laid off each year teaches art, arts education is kept alive through community fundraising in schools with upper and middle class students. In contrast, low-income neighborhoods where such fundraising initiatives are not as viable an option are losing arts education in schools. In the United States culture, the arts are viewed as a luxury. Students don't need to know just math and science. They need how to work cooperatively. They need to be creative. They need to be able to work as a team. And those are the things that we teach in the arts. We teach creativity. We teach team, um, team working. We teach how to get together and share ideas and develop new ideas based upon uh, broader issues. The education system in the United States uses test scores to quantify knowledge into numerical outcomes. However, when young people enter today's oversaturated and highly competitive job market, they are expected to excel in creativity and critical thinking, skills that are undermined by the current educational models and standardized testing. What I tell my students often is that no one is going to hire you because you know how to answer one of four multiple choice questions. They want you to actually ask the questions. They want creativity, they want critical thinking, they want open-mindedness. Yes, I teach them how to draw, but I also teach them how to observe. What we foster in the arts is teamwork, um, critical thinking, thinking out of the box. 
music, arts, it's a way of discovering who you are in a place like the United States, a place like the city of Chicago. Um, I think it's very easy for you to lose your identity and just become one more of many. You hear that story over and over again of someone that uh, discovered who they really are. And Listen to your own song. Arts education is rapidly becoming a luxury in many schools across the country. Independent non-for-profit organizations like Old Town create cultural outlets for communities that are underserved, providing a link between diaspora and mainstream cultures. Vanessa Bergonsoli with Carolina Krohn for Telesur, United States. Well, that's all for today's The Real USA. Don't forget you can always send us your suggestions and comments to our Twitter at Telesur English. I'm Alexandra Hall. See you next time.